Raiders and the New Orleans Saints on ABC Monday Night Football. From the NFL to youth leagues, the crashing of helmets and the roaring crowds, the culture of football is as ingrained in our American culture as mom and apple pie. And the harder players hit, the louder the cheers. With each hit and tackle is the chance any player can develop CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, a progressive brain disease caused by repetitive hits to the head with symptoms like dementia, slurred speech, severe headaches, depression, anxiety, and problems with balance and vision that don't appear until years after the injuries. Sadly, the only way to determine if a patient has CTE is to examine their brain after they're dead. Zach Easter of Indianola, Iowa was tormented by all the symptoms and took his own life at the age of 24. Story about a guy who fully bought into that, that football culture and sort of that tough it out culture, which eventually became Zach Easter's demise. I realize that some of this might be shocking for some of you reading this. But anything I've portrayed to anyone in the past six years has been a lie to conceal. Mistakes. It was Zach's handwritten journals that intrigued Minneapolis sports writer Reed Forgrave to learn more about Zach's struggles after being diagnosed with five concussions, three while playing high school football. I don't look back on my life with regrets because at the time I loved my social identity, of being the tough guy and being popular because of football. Yeah, yeah, he titled it Concussions, My Silent Struggle, and it documents going back to third grade when he started playing foot tackle football up through high school when he stopped uh concussions happened again and again and again and he really suffered through them from a mother's perspective it's a blessing and probably a curse because now we know I know for a fact that all the things I've experienced in my life are from using my head as a weapon. Among Zach's request to his family was to have his brain and journals sent to Dr. Bennett Omalu, the California neuropathologist who discovered CTE. Dr. Omalu was portrayed by Will Smith in the movie Concussion. I found a disease that no one has ever seen. <laughs> Repetitive head trauma chokes the brain. Dr. Romalo confirmed that Zach did suffer from CTE. Over the century, it was a well-documented and proven and confirmed fact that there was no safe blow to the human head. What Dr. Romalo says is his solution for this, uh, because he says, shouldn't be able to play football until you turn 18. I mean, full contact, helmets and pads football, what we think of as actual football. Um, and the reason he says that is because that's the point where the brain is, is, is close to fully developed. Zach began playing football in the third grade, just like his two brothers. Just kind of the kind of guy you were scared of. People respected him and they didn't want to go head to head with him, I can tell you, I can tell you that. Zach's dad, Miles, was a college football player and is now a coach. We all played the, in the youth football program here in Indianola. And I'd say football is real important, you know, to us anyway. So I think it teaches um, kids how to be a part of a team. It teaches you work ethic, it teaches you responsibility, and there, there's a lot of life lessons in football. In his book, Love Zach, Small Town Football and the Life and Death of an American Boy, Forgrave explores the mindset of the sport and Zach's football-obsessed community. Reed, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to St. Louis, uh, our listeners and our viewers. This will also be in a podcast, so I appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. This is, uh, I mean, I went to school just down the road at University of Missouri, so it's cool to be uh, back in St. Louis. Another virtually. great journalist. We, yeah, that's right. Way too many of us, by the way. It can be, can be like a locust infestation at, in, in Columbia sometimes. <laughs> well, we, we appreciate the work that you've done and introducing us to... Um, your first book, your debut book called Love, Zach, Small Town Football and the Life and Death of an American Boy. Yes. And I got the advanced copy, so I'm using it as my cliff notes here. And I read this a couple months ago. Quite an eye opener. You, you think of Texas, 
at least I do. Uh, high school football is a religion, uh, states like that, because it's, you know, everything's bigger in Texas. But it's really all over small towns all over America. And you really point that out in the book. Also, I've been thinking of my husband, who's from Southeast Missouri, a little town. All the money goes into their football stadium. The whole town comes out. They follow them when they're on the road. It is truly a mindset and a culture. And that's what you delve into with Love Zach, because, you know, it's, it's heart wrenching, it's tragic that a 24 year old boy takes his own life because of football injuries. Would you describe this book somewhat of as, as a warning, as an education? It really is kind of a, a memoir, autobiography, so many things wrapped into one because of what Zach left those who survived. Yeah, I mean, in one way, this book is a cautionary tale. It's a, you know, it's a story about a guy who was, who fully bought into that that football culture and sort of that tough it out culture, which eventually became Zach Easter's demise. I mean, this was how Zach defined what it meant to be a man. He was the uh, the middle son of three sons. His his family had lived on this land in outside small town Iowa for seven generations since before the Civil War, and their definition of what it meant to be a man very much sprung from living off the land and hunting and, uh, and, and being tough. And in modern day America, uh, often the way that that is expressed is through football. So is it a cautionary tale? Yes, absolutely. Especially for someone like myself, who's a parent of two young boys. Uh, I don't think this book says don't play football. Football should go away. Not in any means. It goes into both the risks of football and the rewards of football. This is a story about Zach. Really, I think this is a it's a story about America, right? Like what it means to be a man in 21st century America. Uh, it's about parenting. It's about what fathers pass on to their sons. I, I think one of the catchwords out there uh, today is toxic masculinity. And I think this book is really about that blurry line between what we think of as traditional masculinity and where that morphs into toxic masculinity. And I think it can be really hard to say where that line is. Uh, because if you look at Zach's father, he's a loving dad. Uh, he was a football player, division one football player, grew up loving this sport, was a college coach and then became high school coach for all three of his sons. And he really hammered football into their, uh, you know, into who they, their identity, I think. And there's good in that. There's good in teaching a boy to become a, uh, you know, a strong, tough man. But then it can also, it comes fraught with potential pitfalls when you're being not just tough, but stoic. When you're not just being strong, but you're ignoring some very, very concerning symptoms. And I think Zach is emblematic of all those things. You know, that's a good point, and I'm going to turn to page 27 of the book because I mark this. And it, it sums up what you just said. Zach actually writes this, and for those who haven't seen a synopsis of the book, you got a little glimpse of it in the beginning of our, of our interview, but uh, he, he leaves a memoir that is so vivid and heart-wrenching, but lucid at times that you feel what he's going through in his mind and physically. But along the way in his, in his writings, in his journals that he leaves for his family. He writes, quote, I won't lie. I look back now and always felt like I had something to prove to my dad and trying to fill my older brother's football shoes. That kind of sums up what you just said, Reed. Yeah, I mean, I think what, what makes Zach's story stand out amidst the many stories, the tragic stories that we've heard about football and concussions and, and in some cases CTE, the disease that Zach thought he had and turned out, you know, posthumously they studied his brain. And yes, he did have this disease that we associate with 20 year NFL players like Junior Seau. What sets Zach's story apart is that, like you said, he left behind these writings. He left behind these handwritten journals that document day by day his up and down moods. He left behind a 39 page typewritten autobiography uh, that shows, he, he titled it Cush Concussions, My Silent Struggle. And it documents how going back to third grade when he started playing foot, tackle football up through high school, when he stopped, uh, concussions happened again and again and again. And he really suffered through them. And then also his girlfriend, Allie, uh, who I think is one of the heroes of this book, 
gave me just a boatload of text messages. So, so what's different about this book is Zach is speaking directly to you from beyond the grave and it can be very haunting. And that line that you brought up, uh, he, Zach is smaller than his father. He's smaller than his older brother. His older brother is in the Indianola High School Athletics Hall of Fame. His father was this well-known football coach in town, so well-known that they speak about the Easter mentality, which is basically rub dirt in it and take a lap, be tougher than the other kid. Uh, Zach was smaller than his older brother and smaller than his dad, but a lot of times they would, they would talk about Zach had the strongest mentality out there. He was the toughest son of a gun out of all of them. So even though his body didn't measure up to what we see as football stars, his mind in a way was exactly what every football coach wants. They want someone who's fearless. They want someone who will put their body on the line. Unfortunately, Zach took it too far. A coach wants you to go completely all out these days in 2020 in American football, completely go out all out without abandon until that point where you're about to bang heads. It's really hard, I think, for modern day football players to be able to walk that line where it's like, I'm a warrior going to war. And yet if I do this, that's the worst thing I can do. I'll get a 15 yard penalty. I'll get kicked out of the game. And my brain might be permanently messed up after, uh, you know, a series of these. Uh, it's a difficult position, I think, that athletes and parents are in right now when we look at football, because now, unlike Zach, we know now. We know now what can happen from this. That's important, because when you look at the timeline for Zach, he started at third grade in 2015. So third grade, he starts football, plays it all through high school, stops after high school. But that's when really all the trauma kind of well, it was happening a senior year, but it really rears its ugly head during college until he passes in 2015 at age 24. So let's go back a little bit, Reed, because you, you delve not only into the history of football, which is important for someone like me, coming from mostly girls in my family, not that we didn't like football. It just wasn't that mentality uh, that my husband grew up in, uh, only an only child and a football player in high school. So, you know, it, it put it in perspective for me, uh, which is great for all the all readers out there. So when we look at going back, he didn't really know about CT. It really wasn't even in the, in the media. It was just coming out maybe his senior year. I think you wrote in the book about some of the findings others were writing about, uh, other of your uh, colleagues in, in journalism and in sports journalism. So describe to us CTE, which stands for Chronic Traumatic Encephalopathy. I practiced that. Um, Not an easy one to practice. It's a big <laughs> word. <laughs> Which means what? What does that mean? What is going on in the brain? Think of it as tearing and bruising of the brain tissue. Uh, when you get these hits, that, 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 that sort of the, the brain is, it's delicate. It's protected by the skull and by fluid in there. And it's not just when it gets actually hit, but when it gets jostled, when it's going really fast and then stops, it can be bruised and it, 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 it will tear up. And when it tears, and I'm, I'll do this the best I can in a layman's way without being a scientist myself, but basically like uh, enzymes are released, proteins are released, and there will be a protein buildup. And that's when, when doctors like Dr. Bennett Amalu, who actually was the one who sent the email to Brenda Easter saying, we got results from the brain study of Zach, and, and yes, he does have uh, stage two CTE for a 24 year old, which is just uh, really scary, I think. And he's also the doctor who basically discovered this disease, played by Will Smith in that movie Concussion. Uh, but he, you can see the buildup of proteins in the brain. And think of it as sort of congestion on the brain highway, in a way, that things don't move as, as quickly as they normally would. Um, it's a scary disease, right? It's really scary because it's one thing to have a broken arm. You can have an x-ray to tell you you have a broken arm and you'll be better in two months. It's another thing. You, you don't have an x-ray that can say you have a broken brain. It can't be diagnosed until after death, uh, which is, you know, the science on this is just so, so young. And I'm glad you bring up the timing of this because Zach graduated in 2010 during his senior year of high school was when uh, Jean Marie Laskus uh, 
wrote an article for GQ magazine uh, about Ben and Amalu and sort of the fight uh, of these researchers against the NFL that became the movie Concussion. And that was at the same time that Alan Swartz with the New York Times was writing the first articles equating these, these tragic suicides from NFL players with this, this crazy brain disease. So Zach's parents have culpable deniability in a way because they didn't know. I mean, he always knew football was dangerous. He didn't know it could you know, permanently alter the brain. There were so many coaches along the way, including his own father, um, I don't know if they were in denial. I don't get, I didn't get that from this, from your book. It's just like, we didn't, we, we didn't know. Um, this is, this is, they knew what they knew, you know, put him, put me back in coach, that whole mentality that Zach had and so many other young men playing football really made it hard for trainer Sue Wilson. I had to empathize with her when I read about her because it was really her against everyone else for many, many cases. Parents were against her because she's the one that's saying, I'm taking your helmet and you're sitting out the game. She would look in the eyes of the players and specifically Zach. And, uh, you know, he was good at lying as much as he could to get away with, to get into the game. And so many players are because that's a tenet of football, right? Be tough, uh, tough it out. You get a bum ankle, whatever. It's Friday night, get out there and be the star. Uh, that is I mean, I do think there's some some good in that mentality, like the life lessons fighting through adversity. But boy, when it comes to the brain, uh, that's incredibly dangerous. So Sue Wilson, she was hired as the trainer at Indianola High School in the mid-2000s, just as Zach is entering this high school program. And I think, first of all, the fact that she is a woman entering this like super macho wor world made it incredibly difficult for her. And also because she was ahead of the concussion curve. She was paying attention to this uh, more than, uh, you know, more than just about anyone. And she'd be on the sideline on Friday nights. And what she would say, if a player suffered a hit that seemed to be a concussion, and remember, even now, even in 2020, we don't have like a sideline test that you can say for sure, this is a concussion, you're out of the game. It's, hey, I'm going to look at your eyes. Are your eyes jiggling? Are you foggy? Are you focused? And I'm going to guess that you have a concussion. We're not going to risk it. Uh, she'd take their helmet and she'd be like, I'm taking your helmet. You're not going back in. Coaches would be mad at her. Fans would be mad at her. Uh, parents, parents of players who were taken out of the game would be mad at her for taking their son out of the game. I want to talk about the parents because you do a very good job of describing their relationship because that's very vital, as you mentioned earlier, that, that mindset, that culture, but mainly the mindset within the family. Football was a religion to them. It was their life, including Brenda, who married the dad, the Miles, and had the three boys. And it was just ingrained in them. And, and they all accepted the, the, the bumps and the bruises. But the, let's talk about guilt. Um, yeah. Did they ever feel that? He talks about it somewhat in, the, in your book. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Brenda is, so, so if I could like just give like a brief overview of their personalities. Brenda is a fixer. She is the president of the small town chamber of commerce. She knows everybody in town. If you bring Brenda a problem, she's, she's a lot like my own mom where she's like, okay, you have a problem. Okay, right now I'm gonna to try to come up with solutions. When she finds out Zach's suffering, uh, she says, okay, let's fix it. Um, those are her exact words. She's going to his doctor's appointments with him against his, against his will almost. She's trying to find uh, clinics that deal with both addiction issues and traumatic brain injury issues. I, I think Zach did have some uh, drug and alcohol addiction issues. I'm not sure where the chicken and the egg comes in, but uh, I'm not sure if it really matters. Uh, his father's different. His father, I think, in a way, feels much more guilt from this. Uh, I think he is tortured and on a daily basis devastated by this, but he's not someone who's going to go share that. I mean, I quoted him. I'm not going to give you the, the full quote because I believe uh, this is a little bit profane and there are some profanities in this book, but he said, I'm not going to therapy. I don't need no therapy. Uh, he's not a guy who's going to talk it out. He grabs a couple of beers. He goes out with his two dogs and goes into the woods behind their house with a shotgun and goes hunting. That's his therapy. And I think he feels an enormous amount of guilt because he ultimately was the one that pushed his sons into football. 
he says in the book, uh, it came to the point where it's almost like I love football even more than my sons did. Um, he was obsessed with it. And yet I think there are two things that kind of keep him going on. One is that he didn't know. Uh, if he knew, if this was going on right now in 2020, if Zach was a you know, sixth grader in 2020, and then he pushed him that far, uh, going through concussion after concussion after concussion, uh, I'm not sure if Miles Easter could go on. And the other part that I think brings the rest of his family, uh, you'll never get past this, right? You never should, but bring them, lets them move forward is the fact that Zach left uh, all these writings that it sometimes blamed football in certain points actually blamed uh, sort of his spot in the family. Uh, you know, talk about that older brother and father quote that he always had to live up to him. But most of them say, please don't blame yourselves. Please don't blame football. Make a meaning out of my life. And I think this family, that is in, in a weird way, the, the silver lining to this really, really dark cloud that Zach gave them a charge, said, make a meaning out of this awful, awful tragedy that is my, my life and death. And in fairness to the family and friends and Allie, uh, well, whom he was more open with was Allie, his girlfriend, uh, which you mentioned the text messages were so uh, helpful in getting into the psyche of and the deterioration of Zach, but th that he hid a lot of his pain. Yeah. Uh, he he was must have been pretty darn good at it. I think a lot of people are. Um, and, and this is not, like I said earlier, this is not a disease that you can take an x-ray of. Uh, a lot of it depends on how good is someone at faking it. Um, back then, I think the mentality was, of course I'm going to fake it because I want to play next Friday night. How do you explain Zach's uh, top moments when he was at lucid enough to be so descriptive about what he wanted done, how he felt, versus someone else who takes their own life and leaves nothing? Yeah, I mean, he had some sort of foresight uh, that he should write this down. Uh, he pings back and forth between being hopeful and being like, I'm going to go get this job. I'm going to apply for six jobs today. Uh, I'm going to quit chewing tobacco in the next month. I'm going to be a millionaire in five years. You see him have these big ambitions. And then two days later, you see him say, I went to the therapist today, but I just sat in my car in the parking lot. I couldn't go in. I got a bunch of cocaine and I did it. And, uh, you know, F this. I don't, I don't want to live anymore. That's very CTE of him. He's pinging back and forth with these emotions. He's, you know, in his less lucid moments, he's doing things like going to uh, the hardware store and forgetting why he went there, uh, just wandering around the hardware store, not knowing why he's there. Things like driving back home from Des Moines to his childhood home and getting lost. Uh, but he has the foresight to put these, put pen to paper and record these moments. I, I like to think that Zach in a way knew that there was some sort of value somehow uh, you know, for himself and his own memory issues, but also just for writing this down in a way for history. And it was, I mean, without Zach's writings, this, this, isn't, this isn't a book, it's a, it's a tragedy, uh, but Zach is, doesn't speak to you from beyond the grave. That's the power uh, of this book. Dr. Omalu had mentioned at one time that maybe kids shouldn't play high school uh, in, as young as third grade, or even middle school, or even high school. But the problem is then you can't recruit for college or for the NFL. That would be an issue, I suppose, right? What, what Dr. Amalu says is his solution for this, uh, because he says, shouldn't be able to play football until you turn 18. I mean, full contact, helmets and pads football, what we think of as actual football. Um, and the reason he says that is because that's the point where the brain is, is, is close to fully developed. Um, and it's because he looks at age 18, he's like, that's the age of legal consent. Uh, some people like to smoke cigarettes. They know it's damaging to their body. Turn 18 and you can do that legally. It's sort of the same analogy with football. Uh, I, I think it's, you know, Benito Mala didn't grow up in America. He didn't grow up in this culture. Uh, I grew up in Pittsburgh. I grew up in a place that has such a football co culture. You know, in fact, that was where Benito Mala was working when he studied Mike Webster's brain, uh, was essentially patient zero in this CTE, uh, I don't know if I want to call it an epidemic, but crisis, I think would be a proper word for this. 
um, when you grow up in that culture and you look at the idea of don't play football until 18, well, you're like, okay, then in a generation or two, football goes away. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a bad thing. I tend to think it's a bad thing. I'm still, despite writing this book, I'm still a football fan, which either makes me honest or a hypocrite. I'm not sure which well, one. You do write at the end of the book that you still love football. Well, sit down and watch it, but you and your wife have an agreement. You're not going to allow your two young sons to play. Are you still holding true to that? Yeah. I mean, it, it's our sons are eight and four right now. And right now my wife and I talk about this in the theoretical, right? Well, now I do think it's a different conversation when one of my kids is 14 years old and all his friends are playing football and he's been tossing around the background in the backyard for years. And he's going to come to me and be like, dad, all my friends are doing this. Why can't I do this? I'll be careful. Tell me more about the helmets. How protected is my son going to be if I have one? Um, those kind of things. Are the coaches and trainers more aware now that they will take a child out of the game? So, uh, see, do you see that there's more protections that you can kind yeah. of validate it? It's not perfect, but from the NFL down to like Pop Warner and Pee Wee football, there have been improvements across the board. NFL's made 40 some rule changes in the past decade. Uh, you see players ejected, especially in college. I think college is actually taking it more seriously than the NFL, but like targeting penalties, head on head contact, boom, you're out of the game. Like no questions asked immediately. Um, in the NFL, it's, they're, they're taking it not quite to that extent. And there are times that, uh, that you will see players with big hits. You're like, why did that guy not get, not get ejected immediately? Why is this even a question? But, you know, it's a billion-dollar industry, right? $15 billion a year in revenue. Uh, so it makes sense in a way that they, they, they treat it a little bit more easily, I guess. One of the things that Brenda Easter, Zach's mom, is so excited about, they started a foundation in Zach's honor, and they're trying to uh, – they're funding a – they refer to it as a saliva study, which is basically like you get a big hit, you uh, on the sidelines, you spit uh, in a cup and that can be tested. The proteins and enzymes in the spit can be tested to say positively, yes or no. Yes, you got a concussion. No, you didn't get a concussion. So it takes out the lying and the guesswork of doctors. Uh, that's an important step, but it doesn't solve the, the, the subconcussive stuff. And that's where I think subconcussive hits are, that is the existential question for the NFL and I think for football uh, as a sport. Well, hopefully uh, helping other families and especially through their CTE, hope their foundation that they can help with research. So that's terrific, Reed. Thank you. Reed Forgray, thank you so much for joining us. This is awesome to be here. I really, really appreciate you spreading the word about Zach's story. You bet. And again, proceeds from the book do go to their foundation, CTE Hope. And if anyone's interested in buying the book, they can go to Left Bank Books right here in beautiful St. Louis.